Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I can't hear y'all. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Viola Green, and I am the executive director of the International Institute for Family Development. Thank you so much for coming. What we're doing here today is we're bringing one million jobs to the continent of Africa. And each one of you in this room today will play a role in making that happen. The role that you will play will be up to you, but you sitting here shows your commitment, your dedication, and the effort that is necessary in order to change the trajectory of Africa across how we see it. Rebranding Africa to be the Africa that it is meant to be, sovereign in its own dignity, with its people to be mighty, and with the promise that we have of a goal and the new trade deal. There's marvelous things that we can accomplish together so bridging the diaspora together in order to make that happen is all about today's work. So today you'll have a bunch of panelists who will come up and have conversation, expert people who will be speaking from their spirit and from their soul, from the work they've done all across their career. But these people are just more than figures that are having conversations. These people are deeply committed and committed to the work after words. So in this room today, you will hear from us continuously. There will be ways and opportunities for you to become partners and to invest in any capacity that you can. So I want to take this moment to say, it is not by my might, nor Muna's might, nor anybody in this room that we are here today. So by that which that gives us strength, whether it's a god you pray to, a goddess that you admire, or ancestors, we give thanks for being here today. There's also a set of people that have come before us that have done great work. Those people have not, are no longer here, great humanitarians. We want to acknowledge two of them today, two separate families, the Reynald family and the Condoli family. One of our guest speakers today here, Curtis Reynald, just lost his son. As we see people, we, know, we don't know how they're walking into this world. But they're doing great and marvelous things, and his son was a humanitarian in his own right. We want to give a moment of silence to him and also to the Condoli family, which lost both their, a father and a son, both admired and loved and cared for and did great work all throughout the continent of Africa and in Liberia. And if you would join me in a moment of silence to give honor to all of those who have done work and that we pick up and carry on their legacy, I appreciate it. Thank you. We need to give honor to the partners and contributors and collaborators that we have here. This could not be done alone or single-handedly. So the nights of figuring out how do we get people here, how do we get food and catering, I need to give honor to Edge Food Foundation, Mr. Sheldon Williams, my partner in doing this work. Sankofa Repat Organization, Ivy Hub, Young Boss Media is here. And also representing is I, Gabby, who will be covering and posting this event. We have a ton of other hosts and supporters that we think. Bridging the Gaps Trust with Pauline, who will be one of our moderators that will be here today. Victor Foley from Ghana Disaster Network, Black Emergency Managers Association. So we just want to give a round of applause for all of those people that are doing the hard work in order to make this happen. do a little bit of housekeeping. The food is up and available. Please feel free to take care of yourselves and eat as much as you need to. Outside of these doors and to the left and around the corner, no, to the right, to the right and around the corner are the restrooms. Please feel free to use the restrooms at your leisure. They're available. The panel will have about a half an hour to have conversation. The conversation will be prompted by question and then dialogue. 
Within that time frame, there will be questions from the audience that will come out. We'll go around with microphone to have a couple of questions to give to, to get some interaction. Following that, at the, towards the close, at around about 11, 15, we'll have another uh, 15 minute, 15 to 25 minutes of audience conversation. And then we'll follow out by more networking and action planning. Does that sound like something you guys can agree to? Yes. All right. Well, with no further ado, I'd like to call the first panel up. The first panel we will have will be the conversation on trade, the effects of AGOA and the hopes of AFCA on Africa's social and economic development. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before you is Pauline from Zimbabwe. I'm the founder and director of uh, Bridging Gaps Trust, uh, which is a, an organization which is uh, women-led. And um, the main goal of the Bridging Gaps Trust is to um, empower women, to help them to um, be independent, and also to protect girls, young girls, uh, who are being uh, abused in our societies, and also to make them um, change agents in our societies so that they can do uh, projects and then they can live a life uh, with dignity and uh, feel independent. So we are here today to and discuss more on um, how we can build our Africa. So we have our panelists here. Um, Ambassador Don Liberi from Ambassador, uh, former Ambassador to Burundi. Thank you for being here. And then we have Cloud Pierre, advisor of USA to Rwanda. Thank you, sir. And then Jean Cloud um, Atusameso. Thank you, sir. Okay, these uh, panelists of ours will be uh, discussing on the effects of AGOA and the hope of um, AFTCA on Africa's social economic development. Um, so I leave that to you to open the floor. Thank you so much and good morning everyone. Good morning, good morning. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I want to take this opportunity to thank the conference organizers for doing such a great job, particularly in light of the challenges that we have right now. I want to thank all of you for being here, being brave enough to participate. And as Viola was saying, the big work begins afterwards. But I think Viola and Una have started such a, a wonderful effort here, and it's for us to all share and contribute today. Um, just to, uh, I just want to give you a minute about my own background, because I've had uh, the, the, the honor of living and working in Africa for most of my career. Six different countries. I started out with USAID, the Agency for International Development, and served in Senegal, Niger, Ghana, Uganda, three years in Nigeria, and then most recently as U.S. Ambassador to Burundi. And so over the, the course of the 25 years that I've lived and worked in Africa, I've seen such a dramatic change in terms of the economic development, the ability of you know, African men and women to really develop uh, a vision for the future of where Africa is going, all 54 countries in Africa. And so I think that this is a very opportune moment to see where we are now and what the future can bring. And I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking about what I'm calling a three-legged stool. Everyone, I think, here is aware of the fact that given the demographics in Africa, 20 million new jobs per year 
are needed in Africa to keep pace with the number of youth that are entering the job market. 20 million, that's a lot. So the question before us, and what we've been asked to address as a panel is, how can opportunities like Adola, like AFTCA, assist in that process? And I'm going to add a third one that I want to talk about as well. So let me just talk a minute about AGOA, African Growth and Opportunity Act. Everyone is aware that it started in 2000, it's been extended to 2025. Question is, what has it produced? How has it helped? Um, the advantages of AGOA are that there are 6,500 products that can be imported, duty and tariff free, into the United States. It does extend to 38 of the 54 countries. Since its beginning, uh, there were about $22 billion of exports from Africa into the United States. That has tripled to $61 billion. So we've seen a nice steady increase. Recently, however, it has plateaued. And so we have to look at this and, and you know, try to analyze why that's happened. And right now, African exports to the United States only account for 1% of U.S. imports. Now, we gotta do better. And African imports to China account for 4% of their imports, and African exports to the European Union account for 8% of their in, uh, imports. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we here, in the United States, in the diaspora, increase that percentage? And that's one of the key challenges that I'd like to focus on uh, right now. Um, the other thing is diversification. Of the 38 countries that are eligible, the majority of exports come from three countries. So exports from Africa to the United States. And those are Nigeria, Angola and South Africa. And the majority of exports are in oil, apparel, and automobile industry parts. Now that leaves a whole lot else that can be developed. And so one of the things that I'd like to emphasize today is the development of small and medium enterprises and partnerships related to the development of small and medium enterprises because that can help to be the engine of growth for Africa to create jobs for youth. Because as we all know, oil produces a lot of revenue, but it doesn't produce a lot of jobs. And so we need to help the base of, of, of job creation expand. So one of the other things I'd like to mention is that there are opportunities, it is estimated that through AGOA, more than 4 million jobs a year can be generated in Nigeria alone if there were to be enhanced development of SMEs. And this is a number that comes actually from uh, Nigerian analysis and it's quoted by the African Trade uh, Organization. So that's challenge number one. Secondly, how can we help with this? And here I'd like to talk for a moment about um, a new opportunity that many of you may have heard about. It's called Build Better Utilization of Investments Leading to Development. It's legislation that the United States Congress passed in 2018, and it is meant to enhance development finance. And what it does is pull together what had been a loan guarantee program, the Development Credit Authority, along with OPIC, which is a, a risk insurance policy. And the advantage to this is that this now creates a pool of potential funding in terms of guarantees and private sector investment of up to $68 billion over a seven year period. This is the kind of catalyst that can help with private sector investment, US and diaspora private sector investment in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's the second leg of the stool that I wanted to talk about today. Um, it's just getting traction because, you know, legislation takes a while. While these two organizations existed, DCA and, and OPIC, uh, putting them into a new administrative format obviously takes a lot of time. 
the U.S. Agency for International Development is one of the key implementers of this, uh, even though it comes, it's, a, it's an initiative that comes out of the White House. But I wanted to make everyone aware of this. And that leads to the third leg, which is the Africa uh, Free Trade Area Agreement. And here again is an opportunity for the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to form one of the largest trading blocks in history. Because with the demography of Sub-Saharan Africa, there will be, in the next 20 to 25 years, there will be more people in Sub-Saharan Africa than in the United States and all of the EU combined, okay? 70% of those people, which will now be over a billion, it'll be 1.3 billion people, 70% of those people will be youth under the age of 25. This is huge. So it's an opportunity, it's also a challenge. The opportunity is that there's enormous creativity, uh, energy, you know, power that will be there for youth to create jobs, and, you know, unleashing all of their potential. The challenge is that if there aren't jobs, um, then people will get disillusioned. So this is an area that, as I keep saying to many of my colleagues, it, this is not just a nice to do. This is a matter of economic development for Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a matter of market development for the United States. And it is an opportunity for all of us to see how future growth and opportunity can happen for the world and also for new industries to be developed that we haven't even thought of yet that will be extraordinary. And it's also an opportunity for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to move from resource-driven economies to diversified economies and to really increase the level of the value chain to move from agriculture to other areas. And so these are the three-legged stools that I wanted to mention and I'll just close by saying there are a couple of overall things that I would invite you all to think about as we move forward. The first is, in order for a lot of this to work, the investment climate in Africa has to be good. People have to want to go there and invest. So what does that mean? Well, that means there needs to be rule of law. There needs to be governance. There needs to be an institutional base so people feel that they can go and invest and their investments are protected. There also is a tremendous opportunity, which I feel is untapped, for domestic resource mobilization in Sub-Saharan Africa, otherwise known as uh, not just taxes, but a development base where revenue that's generated in country can be used for economic development. Um, and then the third area is, if you will, technology that crosses borders mobile technology, mobile banking, things like that, you know, cryptocurrency stuff that's coming up. New, new modes and ways of doing business that can be housed in legal frameworks that can enable growth in ways that we, as I said before, haven't even thought of yet. So that's the sort of the, the big picture that I'd like to leave you with. We have a three-legged stool of a GOA AFTCA and BUILD. We have enormous opportunities. Um, I think that the potential for growth to, to go from 1% exports of African exports to the United States can quintuple. So by 2030, let's see 2, 3, 4, 5% coming, uh, coming from Sub-Saharan Africa to the United States. Let's see job creation increase by tenfold and let's see how a new partnership can be developed um, between countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and the United States. And with that, I say thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for that presentation. Uh, so, as we are engaging, as we are reimagining um, Africa, the question now is, what does the future look like as we move towards creating 100 million jobs um, on, the, on the continent. Our next speaker, please.
Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I will first would like to say thank you to uh, Viola um, for inviting me. And thank you to everyone here in New York City who's come out uh, today under somewhat strenuous circumstances. But this is an important topic for us to discuss because we know that life still goes on, jobs still need to be um, created, people still need to eat, babies still will be born, and we need to still move forward as a global society. Uh, I am very delighted to um, speak uh, following uh, Ambassador Dolan. I work uh, in SME development, small and medium enterprise development. I'm on the ground, I'm in the countries, I'm working with the youth, I'm working with the farmers, I'm working with the women, I'm working with the microfinance banks, I'm working with the small mechanic shops, I'm on the ground working with that SME person who has an idea, I'm working with the cooperatives, the weavers, I'm working with the uh, cooperatives, the pine, I just came back from Rwanda uh, and we were able to see Burundi from where we were in Rwanda. Um, I worked with 2,000 pineapple farmers. These farmers had pineapple for days, from here to Connecticut, you could think. Pineapple everywhere. What were they going to do with it? Pineapple was rotting on the ground. So, they formed a cooperative. The cooperative now um, groups all the pineapples together. They're trying to get aggregate pricing. They, they are now taking their pineapples to market in uh, mass tonnage, which then allows them to manipulate in their favor the market price for pineapple. Um, and now they're saying, what do we do next? Well, that's where I came in. Pineapple chutney, pineapple jam, pineapple ham, pineapple soda, pineapple dry pineapple. Pineapple juice. We need to work with these small cooperatives and these small businesses so they can export this pineapple. That was my assignment. I was there for three months and I wrote the business plan for the cooperative and I linked them with the um, ambassador and the uh, embassy in Dubai, which is uh, the Middle East is a huge uh, appetite for dried fruit. The Netherlands, huge appetite for dried fruit. They don't grow pineapple in the Netherlands. They don't grow pineapple in Dubai. And so this is where the opportunities come in for our brothers and sisters on the ground with these small businesses that are looking for international export. Uh, so this is where things like AGOA uh, comes to fruition. How does, how do 2,000 pineapple growers get their dry pineapple to the Netherlands? Well, you would think it would be easy, but it's not. It's very complicated. There's guidelines, there's restrictions, there's health requirements, there's um, uh, taxes, there's legal, um, and so, one of the challenges that a lot of the small SMEs face when they're trying to get their bicycle into market, they're trying to get their pineapple into market. Or I worked on another project in Zimbabwe where small farmers were trying to get their oranges into Fanta orange juice. I mean Fanta soda, excuse me, into Fanta soda. You would think that would be easy, but it was very complicated. Um, in Zimbabwe, uh, I was working with another cooperative of orange growers who had tons and tons of oranges, everywhere oranges. So Schweppes, Coca-Cola, wanted to partner with small and medium entrepreneurs, SMEs, that were small farmers that had 50 orange trees, 200 orange trees, um, but together they, they might have had over 500,000 orange trees. 
First of all, just to give you a little bit of background on that um, scenario, I was there for six months in Zimbabwe working on this project. All harvest trees are not the same. So you have farmers saying, we have oranges, we have oranges. But I had to bring in an orange tree expert. There's Valencia orange, there's Naval orange, there's small oranges, there's oranges that have a certain amount of sugar content. There are oranges that come in a certain color. Coca-Cola Schweppes, when you look at their contract, for the type of orange pulp that they want in their Fanta soda, very specific. Must be of this quality, must be of this diameter, diameter. must be of this orange content, must be um, ripened through this process. So what you have is, once again, you have on the ground SMEs, small entrepreneurs who want to partner public-private partnerships. They want to partner, they want to get their oranges into the mainstream, but they don't understand the intricacies of that. Just because you have five orange trees in your backyard, it doesn't mean that your oranges are the right quality, the right standard, the right size for that market. Um, I think that there's a huge opportunity, a lot of jobs to be, a lot of jobs to be um, created, but we also have to bring together and find that medium ground between the corporate international marketplace and that small SME farmer, that small SME technology person that has a new app that they're trying to get over to M-Pesa in Nairobi and their app is not compatible. Why isn't their app compatible? Do they know how to get their app compatible? Do they know how to make the connections to someone that can help them work out the kinks in their app so it can become mainstream? I do believe from what I've seen on the ground in several countries, um, as I said, Zimbabwe worked in on oranges, uh, Rwanda pineapple project, Tanzania microfinance project, Ethiopia coffee project, all of these countries have entrepreneurs who are looking desperately to get their product into the international marketplace. But they can't do it alone. They don't know the background. They don't know the legal. They don't know the specifications. They don't have the connections. And that's where USAID, and I have to give them a big plug, USAID has our entrepreneurship program that they send people like myself out into the field to work with these small entrepreneurs, these small cooperatives, these small technology companies to help bridge the gap between private and corporate partnerships. Um, I'd be glad to take any questions uh, at the end, and I do appreciate everyone coming out today. And there is a way to create 200, did you say 200,000 ambassador jobs? Oh, even more than that, we need 20 million. There is a way to create 20 million jobs on the continent of Africa. The people are there, they're eager to do the work, they just need the guidance and they need the expertise to help them, teach them, and um, guide them so that their products can make it into the international marketplace. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, for such a presentation. So, um, being in Africa, we now see that we have uh, plenty of opportunities uh, for us to uh, create jobs, for us to invest in these uh, small projects that can uh, help us to create uh, these jobs that we're talking about. So, um, next we're going to look at the challenges and benefits of AGOA and AFTCA. So, before me can have my name and the name of my father. <laughs> Myself, I'm uh, Jean-Claude, I have Claude, and uh, my father, who just passed away last year, was uh, Pierre, wow. Claude Pierre. That was very interesting, and thank you both, thank you very much for being there. And also thank you to Viola, Viola is a friend, and uh, she was telling me about this event, I said, okay, 
I will come. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C. And when I was waiting to come, all the people I'm supposed to bring here start talking about uh, the virus and all the events we're supposed to have in New York are not happening and we cannot go. And I said, okay, I got that, but I will be there. And uh, for me, For me, speaking about Agor and uh, speaking about uh, the free trade agreement for Africa is like speaking about the blind spot. The blind spot is the fact that you don't know what you don't know, but because you don't know what you don't know, you don't know that you need to know what you don't know. And because of that, you don't know what you don't know. What is happening about Agoba today? The ambassador just told us that for the moment, it's just three African countries who are participating in Agoba. And by considering the product which are used for Agoba, it's the crude oil which is getting 80%. Most of other products are not coming. The question is why? Because sometimes when you're supposed to pay a due and they're taking it away, you can say, I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I'm supposed to be paid for the customer. Now that I'm not paying for the customer, I'm lucky. The question for Africa is, are African lucky with Agoa or not? The formula for lucky is when opportunity meet with preparation. Africa has a lot of opportunities, but Africa is waiting for this opportunity given to them to bring their product in the US or international. I can say Africa is not in way. I have been working in Africa now for uh, 20 years. Myself, I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo. As a priest, I was working in a very poor parish where I had 200 villages. The last one was after 80 kilometers. And at the beginning, I didn't have a car, I didn't have a bike. And as I was walking everywhere to save masses. But at the same time, I was lucky. I was lucky because at the same time I was prepared to do business, even though I was a country priest. And when I got at that place, I saw that there is a, there's no a possibility for me to make a lot of money with prime oil. I didn't have a good capital, but I'm telling you that I made a lot of money. After one year, I was able to buy a big truck, and my non-profit made a lot of money and helped to be with a lot of people in the region. Now, we are controlling, I'm the president of the New Chamber of Commerce of Congo in the US, and we are controlling South Saharan, Sub Saharan Africa, going from Chad to Angola. Our clients consider the U.S. as their market, but we are not the one who are bringing product to the U.S. They are from Ukraine, they buy product from us in Africa, they bring them to Ukraine, and after that they sell to the American market. Why? Because it was easy for us to deal with them than to deal with American businessmen. Now, what are the challenges? Our big challenges in Africa are financial system. Our banks don't understand bank instruments. For example, you are not buying product by or using cash. In order for you to, 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 do, to sell or buy, you need a financial instrument. That's what people of Africa don't understand, and banks don't give the opportunity of providing financial instrument. It takes you a week, a month, to go to the bank to look for 
a letter of credit. It takes you months to make the payments and understand that you 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 want you you need a measurement to do the guarantee of your product. In addition to that, we have a problem on processing our product. Our products are not processed. And you know that when you are selling cool product, you are selling away your jobs. How are you gonna create how many jobs we were saying? 200 million? In order for us to create 200 million jobs, we need to keep what we are sending out first by sending our product as a not natural product and a good product. That's where the jobs are going away. When we need to keep them, then we need to start bringing equipment in Africa to process or to give value to African product. When we're not doing it, we're just using words, but we don't know what are the solutions in order for us to win creative jobs. And that's why we're discussing today with the African Development Bank. Why we cannot do our best to add value to our product. Adding value to African product is giving jobs to our people, is bringing business to our people. Those are the challenges we are facing when we need to go to this international market without really understanding what are the policies on that market and what we need to do in order for us to be ready. But at the same time, we have really a lot of opportunities in Africa. Now, because we have a lot of opportunities in Africa, because we have a lot of source of product in Africa, we need also a lot of technology and a lot of trainings. There are places where people are living with gold but they don't know what to do with it. There are places where people are living with the cobalt. They don't know what to do with it. One day before my president becomes president, after gaining my training here in the US on money, I was explaining to my president that, President, you know that we cannot sell our gold and make money. You know that we can produce a lot of gold, put it in a bank, and get the SKR, and put that SKR on the market, they're going to be trading just the SKR, and we can be funding all our project. We are a producer of cobalt. 80% of the cobalt comes from the Congo. We have today a lot of electrical cars running on the street in the US. I was telling my president, President, you know that we don't need to sell our cobalt. We need just to land the club the cobalt. People must be taking our cobalt and paying us money every month the way they pay for electricity. Mm. Do you know that when you go buy a new battery, they're asking for the old one? And when you don't give the old one, you don't buy the new battery on the same with the same price. The price change. Because in your old battery, you have again the cobalt they can use by bringing new element. In some way, you don't lose your battery because you're not working. Your battery can be recycled to create a new battery. And the element you have there is cobalt. cobalt. In some way, a company can come to us. We sell cobalt for 100 years. Every month we can be receiving money. But African don't get it, don't understand it. Is like I said, it's a blind spot. Those are the challenges we have. And we need to work on those challenges in order for us to get at the level of going to the international market. Now, the question is, can we say that Africa is lost? No, Africa is not lost. Africa has been lucky to send all or some of its children out of Africa. I believe that the African of the diaspora have a big role to play by going back to Africa 
and helping our officials to come out of this blind spot. And by helping them, I think that tomorrow we will be able to understand policies of the international market. We will be able uh, to able to bring a lot of African product, and also we will be able to train and coach a lot of new entrepreneurs in Africa to become a big businessmen of the African of Africa tomorrow. I'm gonna answer questions at the end if you have them. But uh, I can say we have a lot of challenges, but also we have a lot to do to help Africa get to the high level for the international market. Thank you, sir, for that presentation. So we see uh, as Africa, uh, we need to work and we need to appeal to the diaspora out there so that they can assist us. Because um, from his presentation, he was saying that we have the opportunities uh, that are in abundance. So we need uh, support so that we can really understand what we are supposed to be doing and how to add value to the products that we have. Uh, thank you, sir. So now uh, we go to the question. Thank you. That, that is very key, uh, what was just said. Uh, understanding the policies of the international marketplace. And that is the gap that is missing, um, I believe, and what I've experienced uh, on the ground in Africa, is that the policies and the procedures for our entrepreneurs and our SMEs on the ground in, in Africa, they're, they're, what you were describing was basically cobalt leasing, right? You take the product and lease it to someone for 99 years. That is a concept that's not really African leasing. It's either your land or it's not your land, right? It's either your house or it's not your house in Africa. But the idea of leasing, uh, leasing a house, leasing, minerals, leasing equipment. Um, you know, we, we are people who believe in ownership. I built it, I own it, it's mine, it's my cow, you know, it's my house, it's my daughter, it's, uh, it's my car. But there are other concepts out there that we need to bring to the continent, such as leasing, such as renting, such as lease buybacks. I lease it to you, then I buy it back 10 years later. You know, these are the concepts and the policies that we need to bring to the uh, African diaspora uh, so that they can understand new policies and procedures for doing business and doing business in the international marketplace. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, we are done with this panel. So, to go to the next part, uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. Okay. Um. I got the I, I got the I got the microphone. I'm gonna bring around the microphone. Thank you, Mike. It'll help me, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Ladies first, and I get you in the back. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the beautiful session so far. And I might have missed this because I walked in after you all started, but you said three countries were active in Agora. What are those three countries, or which countries are those? Nigeria, Nigeria. South Africa, and uh, Angola. They're, the they're the highest. So they're not the only countries, but when you look at the proportion of exports from Africa to the United States, those are the three largest. And within that, oil accounts for 80%. Okay. So based on everything we heard also, especially regarding agricultural products, how does one get engaged and involved where it's not just, I sat in a session, I heard all this, now I'm back home and it's the same. <laughs> from an agricultural perspective, um, if you're on the ground in Africa and you have an agricultural product, uh, and you want to get into international markets, first of all, you have to remember agricultural products, the majority of them have time limitations. One, one example I always give is I, I, was in, I was in Kenya working with 
with a florist, a, a huge floral um, uh, cooperative, and uh, they had something like 200,000 roses on the tarmac at Nairobi, and it was 115 degrees. Those roses needed to get on the plane, air conditioned, and they were on their way to some wedding or something in Dubai, Middle East, because you know they have some huge weddings. They buy tons of flowers. Agricultural products are time sensitive, they're heat sensitive, they have expiration dates. There are a lot of issues that go along with fresh agricultural products. But like I was saying before, with my pineapple cooperative I work with, they opted for dried fruit. Dried fruit has a longer lifespan. Dried fruit is in that heat, heat um, affected. Um, nuts, fruit, dates, um, as opposed to fresh pineapples, fresh fish. Because remember, anything going out of Africa, you're probably flying it out. You're not driving it out, unless you know it's flying out. So there, there's a transportation cost. As we all know, uh, transportation cost to fly out uh, tonnage is very expensive. So if you're an agricultural person, you have apples, you have fruit, you have, um, maybe grain is better, because obviously there's a longer lifespan with grain. And anything that's uh, very heat sensitive, or time sensitive, or perishable, you have to really look at other ways to rework that product, either can it. We, I worked with mango producers in India. What they did is they took their mangoes all out of season and canned the whole, the whole thing. The whole season was just canned sitting in the factory until pricing was to their liking. So um, sometimes it's not fresh agricultural. Sometimes you need to rework that agricultural product such that it has a longer lifespan or longevity. And go to your embassies and work with the um, uh, agricultural ambassadors and agricultural ministers there to network you into the international marketplace. Value-added processing is very, very key. And uh, so I'm just, you know, once That's what it's called, that, right? It's the called value-added processing. So you make tomatoes, to, to, you know, tomato and paste, something like that. Where um, Africa does have an advantage in terms of agricultural products, for example, is coffee. Because there's a real niche market for high-end coffee, which you find here now in the United States. People are buying it from you know, Starbucks on. So I think it's also important to look at those kinds of products, coffee, vanilla. These are very, very high-end uh, agricultural products that you can export in, in you know, you have to be careful in terms of the uh, export chain to get them uh, to, to the United States. But those are high potential, and the cut flower industry is also huge. Every single rose that is bought now in Europe comes from Africa. It's a huge export industry. Long stem roses come from Kenya, short stem roses come from Uganda. So. And also, okay. I would like to ask something because I think that uh, just going back to Africa, you are willing to do agriculture and what you do. Uh, what uh, we are telling African people today to understand that in addition to international market, you need also to consider regional integration. At the beginning, that's where, that where you start. You can be producing for all the countries around you in Africa. And uh, you have the opportunity to sell your product and make more money. You can now acquire equipment, which is going to be helping you to process your product. And by processing your product, you can sell them in the international market. One example, we are trying to be getting cows from Chad and to sell the like, meat in all over Cameroon, Central Africa because uh, Chad today is producing a lot of meat for all those countries. But in the time, we can be shipping them out uh, internationally. Good morning, my name is Crystal James, and I'm from Tuskegee University, where I'm on faculty. And my question is for, um, first of all, to USAID, USAID. Um, are you guys actually providing um, resources for technical assistance? We have faculty that are in agriculture that can help that do extension programs on um, preservation and also um, other things that will be that will speak to some of the agricultural issues as well as um, around international policy issues 
are there technical assistance programs through USAID that will support universities being involved in that? And for the people that the ambassadors that have been in country, how receptive would the country, um, ministries be to give that technical assistance? Because it is a different way of thinking for a lot of them in regards to how um, you would engage in international policy or into international training, policy that would allow for international training. Right. Um, yes. So well, I'll just one. I um, spent 30 years with USAID and was a mission director in many countries. Uh, the short answer is yes. There are programs funded by USAID for technical assistance, um, particularly for universities. We have a whole Title X program that we work with. We have a special program for HBCUs. Um, now, I am no longer currently at USAID, so I'm not familiar with the latest um, grants, et cetera. Uh, but it's very easy to find out, and it's, um, it's you know, one can go and, and talk with folks there who are in charge of these programs. Thank you. Um, I, we can see that this uh, panel, you know, there are a lot of uh, questions that are coming from the house. So if we can do that, uh, maybe after the, the other panels present their presentations. Thank you. So there's two other questions, two other people here. We're going to get their questions right, out at least on the floor. You want to hold it? I'll hold it. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to get your question on the floor? The other thing I wanted to make mention of is that the International Institute has a cold storage facility and some work that is doing across the continent. So if you're looking to get involved in agriculture and also saving, right, the, the produce that's there and then turning into transformation product, we have some real opportunities in several countries across the continent. Uh, I'll be real quick. Um, my background is financial, so we talk about a lot about the financial resonance. But one thing you didn't hear is a commodity market. When you see the U.S. is strong in Europe, is that they have a good commodity market uh, system in place. Is that something that's being produced in Africa, where you talk about these products? How is your commodity market being developed? What do you market because there was a lot of in Africa. That's why we are saying that uh, we need to improve it. Uh, because uh, like I'm saying, we are we're getting a lot of we have a big purchase order from uh, big uh, buyers from Ukraine, for example. But in order for us to process their order, we need to work with different banks, <coughs> which must help us with bank instruments. But most of them they don't end, they don't get easily. And we are now using a bank in Canada, out of Canada, in order for us to be able to process on time. Because you know when you're speaking about uh, the market, it's like uh, the satisfaction of the client. And if you don't uh, deal with African financial, uh, European or US financial system, you will not be able to be successful in uh, the business you are doing in uh, like uh, commodity or on trade. Stop markets are just getting developed. Yes. Um, we have uh, been looking for other banks to work with, or financial uh, investment bankers to work with in that capacity. Right now, I have someone who's in Ghana uh, on an advisor capacity for, for two projects that I'm looking into. But um, my background is oil futures. I trade uh, oil in New York, uh, New York Mercantile Exchange. And we're trying, since it, since it went from open outcry to electronic, that was got displaced. And um, there's a big, big difference between the um, clients and you know, uh, Clients and serving, uh, servicing your clients on the floor and getting uh, clients and dealing with the physical market, especially in Africa. Uh, especially in Africa, like you said, uh, resource rich. We're trying, uh, trying to do something, still trying to do something in Ivy Coast. 
and also in Ghana in the minerals, diamonds, and oil. There's so much. I mean, trying to trying to <coughs> navigate through some of the, the stuff that you uh, that they put it in front of you, you know. But what you're saying sounds much more interesting. If you already have the, the buyer-seller um, relationship, you're looking for somebody to come in between to uh, um, provide you with the financing, the, uh, the bridge capital. So that's something I'd be interested in speaking to you about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, my name is Raphael. I am representing Ryokong Foundation. Now, my question is basically on a practical side for women. Um, in the last few weeks, we've traveled between Malawi, we're going to Botswana, we're going to Zimbabwe, and we discovered that most of these female farmers are not so educated. Now, with you say and other things, I've been doing user projects in Liberia through EDC for Education and other NGOs we've worked with, but we found out that most of these women can't read and write. So my foundation, in conjunction with Dr. Mina, who is sitting out here, and um, Her Majesty, we decided to get to these African countries and talk to them. We discovered that most of the agricultural products moving are eggs. Why don't we have programs to help women farmers in egg production? Liberia, 69% of the eggs in Liberia is brought from Lebanon. I can quote them because I know most of these guys who bring them in. About a month ago, the head of the UNAIDS were in supermarkets, there was no egg in the country. Can you believe that? So last week while we were in Malawi, most of the female farmers said, can you fly in someone who could train us on egg production? They just released our visas last week for Botswana and Namibia. I'll be going there myself to see before we send somebody there to train. As a man, I will not be training women because it's about women empowerment. We have to have a female figure to do the training. So that is one part. Second part, I noticed discrimination in women on tree planting. I was in Nairobi, I noticed that there was some tree planting exercise by some companies, but women were not involved. So we decided to start up one coming up. We will launch it in Canada in a few weeks, May, because of the planting period, and then we'll be going to about 18 African countries for tree planting. So what are the plans for women in all these things? Thank you. Well, that, that's a very big topic, and it is International Women's Month, right? Um, I worked with the, the, one of the first women-only microfinance banks in Tanzania, putting in 10 branches, and um, just for me as a man to go visit a woman in the field about her chickens, about her cows, about her eggs, it was, a, it was a very arduous process. I needed permission from my husband. Exactly. I needed permission from the chief, who was this man coming in his Range Rover from the city to see this, this poor farmer woman that everyone in the village just thinks has two cows. Who is she? She had to prepare herself. She had to get dressed. She had to put the children away. She had to make sure the husband was okay. And even then, some of the husbands still said, no, no meeting today, even after I drove two or three hours out into the field. So there's a cultural aspect of this uh, economic development. Women are a very big part of agriculture, um, but they're not a big part of the decision-making process in the household. Um, I'm sure an ambassador would like to talk to that because she's a woman working as an ambassador and I'm sure she has even more challenges. But uh, women in agriculture is a very big thing. They run a lot of the, a lot of the um, business, but they don't hold the money to the point where they go to market, they get the money, and when they come home, it's taken from them. Uh, I'm uh, taking into consideration a program I have with my foundation, which is called Eco Village. In the Eco Village program, what we do, we provide inf uh, infrastructure to communities in the remote area. Uh, in those communities, we do our best to give to some women a leadership role, then to give uh, a satellite program of different, in deep of different women in the village. What it's going to be, in some culture, men don't get that. And they can just destroy 
don't talk her because they are thinking that you are creating something in the head of the wives so that they're going to become independent and they will not be respectful and stuff like that. But it's always good to put it in the community. And in the community, you give, for example, the role of woman empowerment to a woman as a leader. And in that role, the woman can join other women. And then uh, it can be for healthcare, also it can be to women, and that uh, maybe after that I can explain all of that. I am 
Dr. Amin Ali, I serve uh, first as a woman, then as a mother. And then I serve as a humanitarian, allowing change to be the very thing that we need. Um, and I say that with great affirmity. Um, you cannot go to a place that you've never been without understanding where you've come from. That means you have to understand what you're bringing to that new space. And one of the things that I like to bring is experience and the know-how through evidence-based uh, surroundings. Uh, I am a Gulf War veteran. I am a mother of six baby girls, and I am a grandmother of 15 children. So I bring tribe, I bring culture, and I bring identity of the Fulani people to you today. And I also bring the understanding of what it is that we are to be as a people. Born here in the United States, I am of uh, Gambian roots, so I have the understanding of what it is to be in a tribe, for a tribe, for the people of Africa. And I bring that to you today in hopefully bringing solutions to the problems that I've been paneled to do. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Congratulations. Go. I know, we try. <laughs> I'm a Fulani. Ah. Hi, uh, I'm Abdullah Jalo. I'm originally from Guinea, West Africa. Uh, I think Liz, we met once before. Uh, I'll see you again. Um, so, I run a media company called Border Nation. Um, we are based in Brooklyn. Uh, we operate in four different African countries right now. Um, I'm just disgusted as to how Africa is perceived. We heard a lot today about the opportunities and the potentials that Africa presents. What we don't talk about is why Africa faces so many challenges when it comes to reaching the international market, the business. Nobody talks about the narrative and how we are perceived, how the business in Africa is perceived, which kind of um, deprive the continent billions of dollars a year simply because people are either scared, people discriminate against us, and our narrative is just bad. And it's very bad that they don't want our product to come to their market. It's not because the product is bad, it's because of the way the narrative has been portrayed. And I'll talk more about that later. Thank you once again. Uh, my name is Akra Fia, um, Nigerian born. Uh, but I always tell people I'm based everywhere because uh, my focus is on Africa. Uh, the last few months, like I said earlier, my team has been visiting between Nigeria, Botswana, Sierra Leone, Malawi, Zambia, Kenya, Cameroon. And the reason why we've been visiting all these African countries is that, especially for the war torn countries, we found out that a lot of ladies have been victimized, have been hurt. So we took it upon ourselves, especially to the guidance of Dr. Amina, who is a Mama Africa to us. We asked her questions. We said, for people like you in the UN, what have been your drive? What have been your goal? And she has always told us that women. So my team decided to visit all these African countries. We assigned female leaders, especially for the countries that are not too much of um, Islamic in nature. And then for some of those other countries, we have males because I remember when we tried to appoint a leader and we posted, our husband refused to allow our work with us for some reasons. So we picked women and we said we are going to focus on training. Now, we visited Liberia at some point, we met the first lady, and she said her goal was on STEM. But we discovered that ladies above 35 say that instead of sitting down in the class to learn IT, they prefer to do catering. So we consulted with somebody from Ghana who would fly into Liberia and teach the ladies about kitchen, cooking and all. Now remember, they've been in war for 14 years, so talking about school is very, very difficult. So we took that as a, as a first project, it worked. And today, I'm very happy we were able to make a shipment again to Liberia of sanitary materials, which will help the manifest lady endorsed it. Because she said, when I met her last year in November, I cannot believe a man can be buying over $100,000 worth of sanitary waste to, to, to distribute in an African country. For her, it looks funny. But when we arrived in Liberia with the team, the ladies did a demonstration, how it absorbs the health benefits, reduce the infection, and the UN women was on board, the UNEs was there, as well as the gender ministry. 
After that day, we had over 150 girls in attendance. Our foundation was endorsed in Liberia by the Gender Ministry immediately because she couldn't believe it. So as we speak, we are here again. We are going to be running a couple of trainings, starting with um, Botswana, Namibia, Liberia, Malawi, on women in agriculture. Most of them might not be able to read and write, but they should be given a chance to excel in life. We interacted with some last week in Malawi who are widows. Now, a widow will not tell you she has anybody culturally to stop her from working. But we are going to make sure that by God's grace, by 2021, a lot of women farmers will be able to produce. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think I want to ask the first question, question to Abdulani. Um, shout out to Brooklyn. My company is also based in Brooklyn, so that's really great. But. Um, as you run a company, what are some of the, you run a company that's based here but is operating in other countries, I'm sure we can swap stories on that, but what have you found to be the most challenging part of that? Um, whether it's engaging the diaspora to go home, what, what do you find is the most difficult part of building your business? Um, I think that first running a business does far away in Africa. So a lot of our, we have an office in Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. Like in Kenya, when it's 1 a.m. here, it's 9 a.m. over there. So I find myself staying up at night to make sure they are ready for the day. But not only that, one of the challenges that I find as an African who have an experience on how either the U.S. market work even Africans don't take me serious, right? So, governments who are in charge of promoting business in their own countries or assisting fellow Africans to develop their own countries, uh, develop their own businesses, don't take me serious, right? But, for example, one of my, my, my employees, Andrew, one of our head um, camera guys. Whenever we go to a meeting, he's white. They think I'm working for him. So they will listen to him more than they will listen to me. So in Africa, that's a challenge, right? But also, um, one of the things that developing the skills, we in the, in the industry, I think, together, whereas we have the talent and the skills, but we don't have the enough resources or help from local countries to help us build something that can either help people in that community or help entrepreneurs in, in that community to advance. So for me, the challenge is more of being taken serious, but also having resources to work with besides just us having to provide everything, you know. I totally hear you on the, like on, on pretty much everything, and you know even even me. I recognize that when I walk into a government office, I walk into a building in Dakar that is you know I need to see somebody important. They're going to see me more than they're going to see you, and that's not fair. Um, and the way that I see it is that you should look at people like me and others who hopefully try and get it, um, to, to work with you to make sure that you are not being treated in that way and that you are being respected. And sometimes you do need an advocate, and I'm here to serve as that advocate if you, if you need to. Um, okay, um, Dr. Amina, I would love to hear more just about your, your background and your you know, work, whether it's been with the UN in different countries across Africa, or what it's like to have worked here at the UN and be be a member of this community here? Okay, well my uh, international work didn't start until 2013 um, and I realized that I had a flag. And what that means is being uh, born in the United States, we just assume the American flag is all we are. Um, we identify with the culture because that's all we see. And we assign ourselves to this cultural adaptation here in the United States because we think that's all there is. So one of the things that was part of my experience in this life is finding out that I am ancestrally from the Republic of the Gambia. So that allowed me to say, I am a people within people. And that gave me a new uh, tenet on who it is that I am. So the background leads 
itself to finding out who you are. And as I open, understanding who you are, you understand what your mission becomes and what your purpose automatically ordains. So knowing that my ancestry is important, knowing that what it is that I have within me is the um, full power of the Fulani people behind me, and knowing that there is a tribe of people that recognizes who I am and accepts what I am. You're not just a number in a paradigm of uh, conglomerates in the US. You are a person, you have value, you have worth, and your commodity is uh, not needing to be traded, but needing to be kept at home. So with that I say, I brought that back home to my international understanding of where I fit in the gallery. So going to an, a new understanding, going to a new land, going to a new uh, environment, you have to adapt. You don't go in with this colonial mindset of taking over and empowering and trying to set your pace. You go in seeing where the needs are and you vast your mission and your purpose based on what the people need, not what you need. So what we are doing in that for women is we're understanding that women are the resource. In Africa, we are a matriarchal society. So what that means is there is power in the woman's voice. So we have to begin to embed it and empower it through the actions and what it is that we term as our true commodity, which is, which is the trade of the talents of women. So in doing so, we bring in a fever, and I use that word because it is a passion that is dwelled up inside of us, that allows us to understand that the women's voice is strong, it is enough, it is empowering. And when we do that, we do that through the understanding of what we're talented and gifted in. So that means if you know that you have a craft, just as my ancestry speaks to the midwives. Um, so my background is in medicine, it is in uh, midwifery medicine, and it is intentionally for home base and home birthing midwives. So this is very, very common in the African country. We are the, one of the few industrialized countries here in the United States that feels as though uh, birthing is a medical anomaly instead of a rite of passage. So we institutionalize our births. So a lot of the training that I got was from indigenous midwives, those that have decided that they're going to take their medicine and make wellness out of it instead of illness out of it. So that brought me into the understanding as to what my power is when I create. When I co-create in this birthing of six girls and understanding what it is that they are to do, I have to understand the feminine spirit, the feminine power. And I had a lot of them in my house, so I had to understand the feminine energy. So knowing how to use that and harness that only brought me to a better understanding as to how to treat our women in the African continent. And you have to treat them with compassion and empathy. They are strong, resilient women, period. It doesn't make a difference which of the 54 you're talking about. They are strong, resilient women. They have the power to do it. But the colonialism and the patriarchal societies that we have been embedded into those um, tribes and indigenous people has allowed them to lose their power, lose their voice, and lose the integrity in who they are. Now, understanding what that means going forward is to mean that that is a key element in moving forward. We are the first teachers of our children. So being the first teachers, we have to understand what it is that we're teaching. Again, understanding who you are, what you are, what your role is, what your talents, gifts, and abilities are, and what your family net worth is. So whether you're in agriculture, whether you're in IT, whether you're in the oil industry, that is a huge piece of what it is you're going to bring forward to your children. But you know what that is, and you know what your gifts are. We are held back a lot of times because of that patriarchal ear um, that we hear, that we have to wait, and we have to understand, and we have to give, and we have to do all of these things other than be who we are. So I think that that's a greater uh, standby in what we're, we're bringing forward with our children and because the youth is so populated in Africa, we have to understand what we're teaching by example. And that should be the empowered woman's voice and the understanding of what we can accomplish if you just pretty much leave us alone. Thank you. Okay, so my next question is for Raphael. Um, so it seems like you do a lot of business and a lot of travel um, in different parts of the world. And I'd like to hear more about the practical sense of, of doing business like that. You know, how do you as an entrepreneur go from Sierra Leone to Liberia to the US to Canada without just falling down tired? How do you, how do, you do that and what do you think is the future of doing business like that across Africa? I think I'll start saying the American dream. 
America didn't start yesterday, they've been doing this for a long time. So, like I said, charity begin, begins from the home. We have Mama Africa to advise young chaps. If you spend your time creatively thinking of how to empower and change the world, a lot of great things will happen for you. Now, if I sit down in America, like say Dallas, that I know very well, and enjoying affluent money that your father gives you from Africa, there was a time I asked myself, you grew up in Oregon, you have so much money, you don't think about the poor because the super rich don't give just for you to know. And when I mean super rich, if your father is Nigerian born and he was the head of customs, you know that there's money. But the reality is that the colleagues, uncles, and all of that that I know very well, I see them with good cars, good dollars, but they don't give. So I asked myself, Daddy, why is uncle so stingy? He said, he's not stingy. But he doesn't see the need to give. So Daddy says that I don't want you to be like my friends, my colleagues. I want us to take a different path. So at some point, we started going to the Catholic Church, and I found out that we had a lot of rich guys in the Catholic Church, and they like to look at you. What is your son doing? What is this guy's doing, son doing? I said, oh, I can unlock phones. He said, really? I just got this phone from the US, but uh, I think it's 120,000 naira to unlock it. Can you try it? I have an unlocking box at home. I was barely 17. I take it into my room, I unlock the phone, and he gives me 60,000 naira. I'm like, shit, I'm not in Nigeria. <laughs> you know? And before I know it, every Sunday, hey, the guy that unlocks the phone. He said, no, no, that's his son. They get scared of daddy because these are the ones talking in church. So I said, but the church is now a little bit political because there's a certain class where people sit. At that point, I decided to change. I said, okay, I'm from an oil and gas background. I want to, to get back to people around. People felt I don't interact because my father was rich. So I started talking to people. I go to you, hello, good morning, happy Sunday. And they're like, was it Rao that you spoke to me? The guy with the Jeep down there, you know? So at that point, we started bringing young guys together. And we say, guys, this is things we want to do. In the next few years, we should own our own oil blocks through our dads. But we found out there was rivalry. Your father is richer than my father. So we had to change that mentality. At that point in time, I said, no, let me leave my comfort zone and go to other African countries to see. I took a star director to Malawi last week. He has a lot of money because we, we invested in this sanitary parts business. Everybody dropped $120,000. I put 200 plus because I wanted to cover more. We bought different franchise countries. I bought Sierra Leone, he bought Malawi, this guy bought uh, Tanzania. We just kept on buying the different African countries' franchise. Now, the, country, the company that makes it for us is in China. They took our money. In a week, we paid $1 million, friends. We bought the franchise and started giving out sanitary parts to different girls. We hired ladies who were very good. They go to the ladies, they speak your local language. That's the only way to succeed. You need to have local partners. So for where we exist, I have females that for in here. She's representing us in Zimbabwe. She's beautiful, she's wonderful. And I trust her for a reason. If you give Pauline $30,000 now, she's going to give you 16 page booklet of how your money is being spent. But we sent some money to a guy in Liberia the other day. He bought a car. When I arrived, I was talking to my partner. I said, hey, how is everything going? And I saw his jacket is more expensive than mine. And I'm like, I just bought this in South Africa when I was rushing to catch a flight here. And the way he was walking, I knew there was not, something was wrong. So I said, Andy, so what did you guys do? He said, oh, sir, you know, we got an operational vehicle. Automatically, $10,000 is gone. I said, we had the star director sign the hundred fifty thousand for you so that we could go to some areas like Grand GD, Grand Barca. We were meeting some ladies in the orphanages. They owned the orphanages. We wanted to give them solar. That grant has been canceled. Because if I give you $10,000 and then you use it for something you don't, you're not supposed to do with it, there's a problem. I said, do you realize that we have a team from Transparency International that flew with us from Freetown to Monrovia just to see this project? Because all these projects are self-funded. We don't take money from government. We don't. Because it takes a long time to write. Even my, my big mommy in the UN, I know how it's like. Been in the UN building two days ago and I looked at all the paperwork I said, let's just, you know, on our own. So the best way to succeed is find the locals in the other country. You trust. Trust is a very big problem. I've been working for you for like two, three years. I just met her this time for the first time. We met at the airport in Nairobi. She's like, this is my boss. And I told the white ladies with me that this is my boss. So they got confused. Who are they, who are they working for? Until they got to see my passport. As far as it is, and I was like, if I 
between the Nigeria and Nigeria. So full of visas. But they are the ones that organize the visas, they do everything for me. I just fly in, see them, we sort out each other and everyone is fine. But my focus is women. Whatever women can do, please guys that are here, let's try and support them. Poultry is the next future because planting is good. I'm, I'm supporting Moringa trees, we're going to do about 20 million trees in Africa. But let's look at poultry. Poultry is beautiful. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yeah, one thing, one thing, if, if I, I know I'm a moderator, but I have an opinion and I would like to share. Is that cool? Okay. Um, one thing that I would like to, to say and kind of challenge you on is about um, people not giving. And I think it's really hard to, um, you know, if you're rich, everybody's going to come out with a hand. Everybody's going to need something. Everybody wants something. It's the same even in, in, in the U.S., you know, like the rich people are constantly being asked to help. So. How do you position yourself to get that help? How are you helping that person? How are you offering a service? How are you thinking about this transaction? Somebody who's mega rich is thinking business. They're not thinking purely charity. That's the mindset. So how do you, if you want something, how do you go and offer them something that they see a value in? Yeah, people's hearts are there, and I do believe that people are genuinely good and gen genuinely do want to see our communities thrive. But I think it's really important to approach um, to approach that with with a business mindset if you're talking to a business person. Okay, that's part two. Now that, that's my secret. I just tap it. Um, some time ago, I challenged my younger brother who's doing a masters here in the U.S. Um, when he talks about his stuff, I tell him. Facebook is your age mate or younger than you. It inspires him. Now, the reason how we succeed is this. I know we give out to society a lot, but actually we, we run an IT company. And as we speak, our company is in Liberia. We are the ones handling the new airport terminal project. That's my project. Great. Now, 60% of the ladies on that site, we brought them from different parts of Liberia as interns. We're training them on how to install the queue system the check-in encounters and all that for all the airlines, either Brussels, Air Marag, KQ, we do that. So we make the money from IT and give certain percentages back to humanity. That's why I've been traveling to all these countries and this week I'm leaving Poly to see some other African countries. That's the reason why we're doing that. So Great. we make money in one to an end and we give out to the other. I think Two. that's perfect. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off only because I would like to give the chance to, for others to, yeah. to ask questions, but um and I don't know where we are on time. Does anybody have a time? Viola, how's how's time? I would say you, have, you have about three minutes. I have about three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um Um, so, I, as we asked earlier in the first panel, we talked about lending is not a, a, a very big thing in Africa. Um, but as to answer your question more directly, as far as what the affluent can do, they can lend as well. Not necessarily money, there's more to a commodity than just the, the monetary value. They can lend their time to the cause. So, Oprah showing up at an event, she doesn't have to give anything. Just her showing up is going to lend excitement and, and, and um, that promotion that is necessary for those that are doing that thing to be a little bit more populated. They also can lend their name. They can put their name on the, the background of something. They can lend that opportunity of knowing that their name is associated with something good so other people will invest if they know somebody else is in it. They may not have invested money, but lending their name will allow other people to invest or at least see that this is a worthy junction. And then they can lend their resources which means you don't have to give money, but you can lend other people. You have interns. Why don't you share interns in a fellowship so that people can get the, the, the jobs done and they don't have to necessarily give the money or have to spend the money. The children need the education and the experience, and here it is, we need the resources as far as the math. So that's a win-win. So lending is just as good as buying if you're making sure that the investment is sure. Sure. Challenge, I'm, I'm, I'm a challenger, and I'm gonna just say still, even so, if you have an intern and you don't, you, you, why? They need to have a clear reason as to why they're going to give resources, time, energy, their name, to one function over another. Because these people are constantly being asked for their precious resources. 
So yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think when you have that power of just like showing up and then it will help somebody like you raise a million dollars, like 100%, I, I totally agree. But it's all about how we package that and, and make sure that it is win-win. But yeah. Um, I definitely agree with you. Yeah, the situation is Africans don't need to be given anything, okay? Young Africans are not begging. The idea is Africa is painted as, as a continent of beggars. We don't, we're not asking for your money for free. You're talking business, let's do business. But we just want to have the same equal opportunity that other people have. That's it. Every, some of the wealthiest people that have come across in Africa, tour in Africa, are priests. Priests, okay? You can see a priest drive a Rolls Royce into a village. Like, come on. What, what kind of business sense is that, right? We don't need to be given anything. Just give us the same opportunity that you afford other people. We come to the table with a business plan. Invest the same way you invest in others. We, we got to get away from this mindset that we need to be given every day. So that's why I really uh, connect to what Mr. Um, Claude Pierre said and Mr. Zan Claude. There's so many business opportunities in Africa. Well, when I was touring these countries, we used to go to the villages. We were doing a film project called Explore Africa, showcasing the best that the continent has to offer in business and tourism. All I was interested in is to profile African entrepreneurs that are changing their communities and their country. We're not trying to sympathize Africa as a continent that's only way for people to come and help us. It's not gonna happen. The crazy thing is, Africa is the only place, or Africans are the only people that can tell you exactly what is wrong with Africa and tell you the solution, yet we continue on the same path. Africans can tell you the, the main problem Africa has is we don't collaborate on anything. We don't invest in each other, we don't contribute. Like, coming to this event today, 60 bucks, they don't wanna pay. But they will come for free, if it was for free, right? But then, we go, oh, the, the Americans, the Europeans, the, the Chinese, nobody's in our favor, but they are the only ones that's going to invest in us. Like, we can't have these double standards. You know what I mean? So we gotta make up our mind of what we wanna do. Are we going to complain or are we going to beg and continue begging? And I understand the level playing field is not equal, but at the same time, what are the responsibilities we are taking? You know what I mean? That's all I can say. Okay. Mm. Thank you, Monami. Sorry that I took the mic. <laughs> you have a point there, but I can also tell you that it starts from somewhere, our governments. The way our government presents themselves to the world, that's how they, 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 they judge us. Our governments only want handouts. They ask and ask and ask. I don't always believe in begging. When you are bringing this food to the table, I should be able to bring something in my capacity. I don't have to bring a million dollars because I'm not a millionaire. But I can bring whatever I can bring to be a part of that process. So why is it that they keep bringing us down? It's because the people that are representing us are not giving our face. They are not giving us what we need to be giving. Africa is a good continent, it's a great continent. We have a lot of potential. But what are our fronters doing? What are they doing to sell us out there to the rest of the world? America is a big giver. America will always remain a giver. You understand? People will look up to America because of what they do. People look up to other countries because of what they do. Africa needs to stand up, and we need to stand up to our government. Our civil society organizations, people say government is not politics, it's not my, my area. But I tell you, politics is what we do every day. It's what we lay. We have to speak to them and tell them, tell them what is right, and let them represent us well. Thank you. 
don't see anybody coming to stop me, so if anybody has a question. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Question. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I think I hope what I've heard is what is he doing as a leader? I'm a transformational life coach. So it's great to say government this, give us that <coughs> as an individual. What is your sense of responsibility towards giving, towards growing, towards transformation? The, the, you know, the excuses and the finger pointing, we can do it till just try to come back. Yeah. And we're not going to get anywhere. So my question always remains when I see problems like this. Does anybody want to? Especially since the forum is labeled the Africa we want. So everyone in this room has an equal share and an equal part. And this is where the empowerment of women. Now, I'm, I'm not anti man, I'm for women. So knowing that is to know that if you're sitting in this room, you have a voice. It's almost like that adage of coming to the table. Well, now the opportunity is we're sitting at the table. What are we feeding? Because if we're sitting at the table, we may want to sit at the table to take. But what are we feeding? What are we giving back in return? That has to be the adage, especially for women. Because we're givers by nature. I mean, we give life. So I mean, just the biggest adage of it all. So we're givers by nature. What are we giving? Now that we have this seat, what are we doing with it? And this is where we have to take that control. And this is where I'm so passionate about it. And you, I know you can feel it and you can hear it. But that is because you have to take your mark. They open the door. What did the brother say? Opportunity, meeting, preparation. If you were prepared before this uh, She Too movement, um, there is a big piece of understanding that your preparation will allow you to be able to sit at that table and speak with the same veracity that everyone else is and know that your voice will be heard. My grandmother used to always say, don't, you don't have to yell. I'm from New York, so that's a problem. But you don't have to yell. She said, if you elevate your argument, you will automatically have people that want to listen to you. You won't have to yell. So that's where my preparation started, getting my argument intact so that I know what it is that I'm speaking about and what it is that I can come to the table. Captain of the speech and debate team, we can do this all day. But understanding what it is that we're debating is understanding point and counterpoint, which means that there are objects to both sides. So we have to understand that and we have to be able to point and counterpoint to each other and be able to be, give a solution in that argument. And that's what we women are supposed to be given that solution. We have it, as he said. We have it. But what are we doing? Are we saying we're going to Ghana or are we buying a ticket and sacrificing mm -hmm. to get there? Thank you. Uh, yes, the gentleman, uh, gentleman in blue. Uh, okay. um, my question goes to uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, Thank you very much. Uh, my question actually goes to Jalo. Um, what are you doing to change the narrative, um, I mean the dominant narrative about Africa um, in your own perspective since you are operating from um, New York here? Um, so media is the most important sphere we have in the 21st century. It shapes how people see you without it revealing you. And that has been going on for Africa from colonialization to now. You ask yourself, what is the CNN of Africa? What is the uh, Euro News of Africa? What is the BBC of Africa? What is Al Jazeera of Africa? Africa is the only continent with no means of communication. Major. Every major country have a means of communication. They shape and control their narrative. What we started doing at Border Nation was to create shows, create TV series based online. The latest we are working on is called Explore Africa, showcasing the best Africa have to give in business or tourism. And what we did is we negotiated with TV stations across Africa, because a lot of Africans don't see other African countries. It's actually more difficult for an African to travel in Africa than for me to travel in Africa. So help other Africans see God, see Tanzania, see Uganda, see Gambia, see Senegal, right? And say, this is what you can do. So it's to create the same means of 
portrayal that has been vested upon Africa for centuries. Say, okay, this is what you know about Africa, what well, he was the present Africa, right? Every country has negative and positive stories, but when it comes to Africa, the only thing you see is the negativity. So, well, let's see some positivity. So we create a short content we profile young entrepreneurs in different countries. We explain why, what is this business doing? You know, how is it changing their communities, these countries, and so forth? And put it out there and let the world see another side of Africa. So that's what we're doing right now. And that's what I think we will be doing for a lot of years to come. That's why we're trying to partner with this tourism board to say, hey, your job is to actually rebrand your country. But you're not doing that, so we can help you do it. If they listen. Uh, we can take one more question, please. We are out of, okay. Let's say we'll consider him or let him ask his question first. And please, we have just a few seconds. Thank you. Hello, this question is from Raphael. Um, how do you see the African countries that you visited um, adopting the blockchain and um, using the cryptocurrency? as a means for, uh, for, uh, for basically sidestepping in um, policies and enriching and empowering themselves, uh, doing business on the blockchain, maybe creating their own cryptocurrency, Africa as a whole and different countries. How do you see that as a tool is my question. Thank you very much. Secret number three. Now, uh, traveling from country to country, I noticed that South Africa is stronger in blockchain because I stay in Pretoria and uh, some of the president is somebody who tries to push for the blockchain business and cryptocurrency. But the reality is that you can't do those things without having proper internet infrastructure. I'm an IT person, I'm an architect, and those are the most important things you can consider. For Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, you have multiple fiber optics running through. They have better communication infrastructure. But in terms like Malawi, like I met some days ago, they are farmers. TRC is one, you know. It's difficult. Now, uh, we were discussing with some people in government. We said, we have a team in Europe that have the funds. If you give us the right link to the president, because we ministers are funny, they did that to us in Cameroon. Just spend $50,000 if you ever see the president. We talk to your president, we want to help you on infrastructure, building bridges, building houses. Nigeria did that with Julius Berger. You don't pay with cash, you pay with natural resources of petroleum, the thing flies in, do an assessment, they agree, put pen and paper, job starts. So those kind of things we can broker with any country with serious-minded uh, political people. If that's possible, yes, for three hours, somebody will give you a call, the team is already in your country and they're ready to work. So that's just basically it. Thank you. For me, for me it's not really a question, but uh, it's the answer to a question which was, what is the reason of you giving? The answer is the mission. To each one of us, it has given a mission. And that mission, you are the only one who will do it. If you don't do it, all those people will not receive what you're supposed to give them. Now, the answer from each of us, if you believe in God, you believe that God is the God of providence who's giving you that mission. And because he's giving you the mission, he's gonna give you the resources to accomplish the mission. And by listening to what you have been saying that a lot of people did, in the US, I work in the one of the richest parish. The collect each Sunday was 50,000 each Sunday. And you see that people give because they feel the mission and they believe in it, and that's why we're doing what we're Okay, let's move back to the moderator. I'll just moderator for a second. Thank you. Uh, so I'm closing this, right? Okay, okay. Um, okay, yeah, so I agree, and I think it's on everyone to really find what that mission is, and also, when you're engaging with others, try and find out what their mission is too, and how can you co-create the impact that everybody wants to see. Um, I will just say for anybody who, I know we're passionate about women here as well, um, 
One of, one of the uh, activities that I'm working on is going to be in Lagos in September, and yeah, so hopefully I'll see some of you uh, in Lagos, but it, it's an impact investing company that invests in small women-owned businesses. And so for me, um, as an entrepreneur, I see that those investments, the small little um, grants that can be donated, given as, as an investment, and the skills as investment, that's where I really see, um, in terms of my mission, is, is how I want to give back, is to support other women become entrepreneurs. So if you're interested in joining me in Legos, or you're going to be in Legos, and you'd like to learn more, please do get in touch. Thank you so much for our distinguished panel for um, joining us. Thank you to everyone in the audience for listening. Anyway, we are a little bit pressed for time, so we want to speed up, then we can end this. I think the end part will be networking. We all need to get involved, because the vision is sending or creating one million jobs in Africa, and our timeline is 2030. Can we do that? Can we achieve that objective? In the next 10 years? Can we do that? Yes. We can. Yes. It's a movement. Yes. I need all of you to be involved. It's a spirited movement. My name is Victor K.A. Foley. Um, I'm a Ghanaian. My organization is Disaster Resilience Network Ghana. Um, it is a community-based NGO addressing the impacts of disasters and climate change influence sectors. I am also a gender activist. We shouldn't leave that for women alone. Men and boys, we should get involved. <laughs> it's not for women alone. So, generational equality, this is the movement. I am going to introduce the next panelist. We are going to speak on security. My first honorable panelist, Mr. Chris Potella. Can we have a round of applause for Mr. Chris Potella, who's coming to the, the panel? He's the founder of Chris Consulting here in New York. We also have Sandra Fonseca, a research physician in Columbia University. Let's do it more for her. She conducts studies in memory loss in African-American descendants. I think I can also join the panelists just like Liz does, so that we can get more engaging. That's right. Security is very important in Africa, and concerning the objective that we have by creating jobs, we know without jobs, is a national security threat. It is very important. Okay, we also have another panelist. You know, it's a period of little bit challenges, so we couldn't get many panelists to join us today, but that is all right. That's Curtis. That's Curtis. Okay, so this is Curtis J. Reynolds, a round of applause for him, former Secretary of the United Nations, Secretary General, Advisory Board on this armament. Mr. Curtis, we are happy to see you. So, let's get straight to business. Rose is also here. Okay. We have Ro Rosie Voter, DJ. Please, sorry if I don't have the name. Sorry about that, Madam Rose. A round of applause for her too. Ms. DJ. She is the CEO of Agricole Organic DRT. I think I get it right, sorry for the yes. A round of applause for this panelist. We are going to discuss about security and I will pose the question, then we can carry on with it. Risk is a part of the world that we live in now. Increasing climate change and effects of corruption are two major factors that can have impact on migration. 
So in what ways can we use FinTech or ICT to help maximize an economic revitalization and create financial security and job security for the youth base of Africa natural resources? It is very, very critical. So we will have Roosevelt Dijin, Roosevelt Dijin, to start this discussion with us. Thank you. My name is Rosie Vukasajin. I was born in the U.S. of uh, Haitian talent. <laughs> I, um, I did all my schooling here, and I had my own business, which was tax consultant. And in 2013, I decided to go back to Haiti to help the Haitian farmers because there was a lot of um, problems with uh, food insecurity. After I did my studies on food security, why the Haitians were having food uh, insecurity, which is the same thing that is happening in Africa, it is because of the open market system. And the open market system demands the liberalization of agriculture. With the liberalization of agriculture comes the insecurity of your population, your borders, your territory. So therefore, the farmers who didn't have the help of the uh, government were now forced off their land because cheaper food was coming in. How do we reverse that? We reverse that by re uh, uh, evaluate by reinforce the agriculture of the peasant farmers. Because big companies are taking over small farming, and small farming is actually the basis for small nations' economy. And this is what we all keep missing. Therefore, by re-investing uh, uh, in small farmers, that we are able to help the farmers regain their livelihood and feed their families and then nurture another generation. Thank you very much. It's very key. Do, do, yes, very key because in Africa we say the backbone is what agriculture, so we need to do whatever it takes. You realize that I was speaking about risks and climate. Now that there's climate change, we realize that our food basket is going to be affected. We need to go down, meet the farmers, the women farmers, entrepreneurs, and do a lot more to them. So thank you very much, Rosa Volta, Dijin. Sorry about that. Okay, Rosie, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So now, um, we can also introduce yourself and give us a little overview, Mr. Chris Botella, on the security and the youth. Hi everyone, um, my name is uh, Chris Portella from uh, Chris Consulting. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizer for putting this together and uh, giving us the opportunity to share uh, what we do and what we think about the, what we want for the future of Africa. Uh, to me, um, migration is a national security uh, issue. Uh, because of um, uh, the corruption that is happening in our country, uh, I would say that uh, the, the younger population of Africa, they are left with no opportunity, and therefore they are, you know, traveling, you know, uh, to, to Europe, to Asia, to the U.S., uh, seeking for opportunities. Very difficult uh, because we have uh, the language barrier for most of them because in Africa you have people that speak English, yes, but also French and some other languages. And it's, uh, it, it's very, a lot of them have very bad experiences. So uh, we have to seek for policy change in Africa because uh, uh, the, the largest uh, youth population in the world is in Africa. But they also feel that like they don't have a decision-making uh, place at the table. So 
they need to uh, to do more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, with the corruption issue is seriously affecting the youth. When the youth normally sees that the leaders they get into government and just few years, few months, they are driving huge cars, <laughs> they are building machines and all of that. It is a security threat for the youth. So we'll throw more light and see how best we can keep it. Sandra, you're welcome. Hi, Hi. Um, uh, my name is Sandra Fonseca. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. And uh, it's my pleasure to be talking about this topic, especially because it's uh, related to youth. And uh, when it comes to job security, and personally I can't talk about that because I've been, um, I had a dream but when I was a child, I wanted to become a doctor, so I had to leave my country to get the training. I went to Bolivia to study. I'm in med school there, and right now I am working here in the U.S. And in regards to uh, um, what is lacking in Africa is the training and the preparation for the youth. There's a lot of, it's lack of opportunity, but also um, there's no, uh, we have to focus on the training. And what you mentioned before, the ICT, it's a huge thing that we, we have to invest in Africa and we have the capacity, but we have a lot of migration of intellectual and human resources to other countries. And sometimes when we come to uh, these countries, we, we have all of the, the training sometimes, but uh, we are more qualified for the positions we end up, end up taking on those countries. So also, when, uh, when it comes to African diaspora, how we can help the youth that's has to, to leave the country and go to diaspora, how they can uh, use their full potential. Uh, because sometimes they have the potential, they have even the training, but since they are overqualified for the position they end up taking, uh, and once we create a system that we can give opportunities to the youth, they will be able to, to do more contribution and also to come back to their countries with all of the experience they can, they can have. I, and I talk about this as, uh, as a medical doctor here. I, I can just base on that because it's something that I know personally, but I know uh, many other areas. Uh, you have a, a medical degree, you come here, and you can get stuck if you don't have the opportunities, and if, you're, if you don't, if you don't um, voice and position yourself. So I, I have to learn that, and I, and I, and I feel that it's something that we can empower our youth as well, how to position themselves and uh, when they have a qualification and, and, and how to overcome all the barriers. Let's say it can be language, but also a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of um, process that they have to go through and how we can uh, advocate for them and, and be able to overcome all of those barriers they have in the, in the country. Also, I, I, I want to say this um, back to the Africa. Uh, we can uh, use the technology to, to train more our youth uh, and also uh, give more opportunities and, and even connect, use technology as a connection, as a bridge. So uh, even in Africa, to the countries, somebody mentioned before that we don't even know each other. And I'm from Cape Verde, uh, West Africa, and, and sometimes there are Africans they even never heard about Cape Verde, and, um, and and we don't know each other from different countries. So once we connect with each other and we start using all the resources that we have, and there's somebody that come. Uh, from another continent and other countries, they are taking advantage of our res our resources, and we are not being uh, we are not being raised to be investors, and we have a lot of opportunities to invest in the country as well. So as a youth, um, uh, to really start empowering economically and also um, giving more opportunities to the youth. So that's what um, I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rose. Yes. Uh, Mr. Curtis, with your huge experience for the United Nations yes. on the advisory board on disarmament, please throw more light on protecting African natural resources.
through creating job security. Thank you very much. My name is Curtis Reynold. I'm a former staff member of United Nations. I used to work prior to my retirement in the UN Office on Disarmament Affairs and also in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Um, my main focus here will be on security in terms of disarmament. I wish to thank the International Institute of Family Development and the ECOWAS Women's Libera for inviting me to participate in this discussion. This is a very important and timely dialogue to be having at this time, as it is high time that Africans, whether from the continent or likely from the African diaspora, to build and define the Africa we need and want. It should be an Africa that works for the benefit of Africans everywhere. For far too long, we have seen our natural resources and our human resources exploited for the benefit of European states, first through colonialism and then through the influences of neo-colonialism. More recently, the continent has been exploited by an increasing number of new actors who have joined the systematic plundering of Africa. I am happy to note that a couple of the previous speakers would agree with me on that point. I hope to provide some value added to the voices of the policymakers and friends of Africa gathered here this morning through the lens of national and regional security as they relate to disarmament. Hopefully, the collective discussion will also explore concrete opportunities to build the kind of security framework that will serve as a platform for sustainable socio-economic infrastructure in critical areas of the African continent. It is an undeniable fact that Africa is prone to armed conflict, political instability, and by extension, economic disruption. I did not go through the long list, as you are more than likely familiar with the major areas of conflict. These include, for example, Mali, Côte d'Ivoire, Sudan, Eritrea, Somalia, just to name a few. As a, peace, as a UN peacekeeper, I myself um, part, participated in peacekeeping missions in Liberia, the Central African Republic, South Africa, Namibia, many years ago. Um, as you can imagine, there are several specific causes for violent conflicts and civil strife, particularly in Africa. These include poor governance, rampant corruption, human rights violations, poverty, ethnic marginalization, and the proliferation of small arms and light weapons. As a disarmament and international security specialist, I will focus on the proliferation of small arms. This is not to say that they are not important that the other reasons are not important. It is just that I want to emphasize the critical role played by the unregulated availability of arms in exacerbating um, conflict in the region. Disarmament um, involves the collection, documentation, control, and disposal of small arms, ammunition, explosives, and light and heavy heavy weapons, and um, removing them from the hands of combatants. The objective is to reduce and ultimately eliminate the unregulated availability of weapons and thereby lower the chances for furthering conflict for, of any kind in the region. There is therefore an urgent need to drastically reduce the flow of arms 
that fuel conflict in the African continent. Millions of dollars are spent on armed purchases in Africa, which could be otherwise invested in various in the various economies to create jobs and other economic opportunities. Instead, this money has gone into the pockets of the major arms dealers in Europe. For example, um, Belgium, United Kingdom, and elsewhere, like China, thereby depriving the African continent of the much needed capital for investment in job creation and for furthering the SDGs. A strong security framework is urgently needed to be in place before we can even think of addressing Africa's development concerns. Development efforts to stabilize conflict affected regions in Africa should focus on a, wide, on a wider geographic area than those that are most fragile. Uh, this means strengthening the resilience of outlying regions and countries can, can help prevent the deterioration in the location in the locations of conflict while providing a more solid base of support for areas affected by conflict. This may require in, intensifying agriculture and strengthening markets in urban and rural areas where displaced persons are living. Private sector investments can also be encouraged in these areas by taking measures to reduce the risk to investors. Um, I heard a number of the previous speakers um, referencing the risk involved. The question is how do we do this? Development efforts must simultaneously provide opportunities to give a voice to the effective um, local leaders and institutions while improving public sector effectiveness. Countries affected by armed conflict and fragility need investment to relaunch their economies, rebuild infrastructures, and create the jobs needed for their young populations. This is absolutely necessary to prevent further conflict and provide for peace and security. As you can well imagine, in situation of conflict, there is a drastic shortage of private investment capital available to fragile countries due to the high risks involved. Um, some analysts would argue that it is simply impossible to ensure against econo the economic hazards associated with severe political conflicts. Additionally, additionally, a general lack of accurate information or misinformation about businesses and other economic opportunities available in the countries is yet another disincentive for potential investors. Um, but the whole point I'm trying to emphasize on is that before we can think about building trade and attracting investment to the areas of conflict, we must secure um, a, plat uh, a framework of security in, in the region. Okay, thank you very much. A round of applause for this insightful Africa Youth Movement Guns. We need jobs. <laughs> so, um, we want to go to um, Rosie. Rosie, um, your issue in terms of agriculture, throw more light um, with the risks and the climate issues. Do we need to influence policy or give more capacity building to women for us to know that we have food security and food sovereignty in Africa? Um, in 
it's a very good question. The first thing we have to think about is, what is security? How do we see security? The first security that we must think about is to feed ourselves. And we did have that in Africa. We had 80% of the world population that was working the land up until 2000, which means you could say Africa had 80% of its world, pop its African population working the land. However, when you have private companies who want to take over food production, then they have policies that are imposed on African governments to remove the uh, farmers off the land and introduce large scale food, uh, big agribusiness. So what we want to do and what we should be doing is actually going back to re-empowering the peasants, the rural farmers, in order to remove or reduce the climate change because uh, there's a few reports that are out there. There's one report that says that European colonization has killed over 100 million indigenous people. That includes Africa as well, Latin America. So this is why we have a climate issue because when people were working the land, they were interacting with the land, with the soil, nurturing the soil, feeding themselves, and that was uh, um, that served as a barrier to climate. It helped rebuild, it helped re-soil uh, the, the, the land. Now when you remove the people off the land and then you have big businesses mechanization and then you have GMO and now people are no longer working on the land and you send them to metropolitan, to cities, to work in factories, then you have totally changed the social economic structure of many nations in Africa. Second part is the African continent has 54 nations. None of the countries in Africa know each other. That's another problem. And they have commonalities. They have common issues, they have common culture, they have common social norms, social values that have been uh, uh, removed or that have been supplanted by different cultures. We need to go back to our traditional values. And that is what will help us develop national development. And to have that, we really need to have citizen empowerment, citizens that are participating in, that are participating in policy making to take responsibility for the government and not allow the government to make policies that affect them, whereas they have absolutely no, um, um, no part in the policy making. Thank you, Rosie. Um, in Ghana, yes, we can do it more for her. She launched uh, a policy called Planting for Food and Jobs and Planting for Exports, and it is making a lot of strides in, in, in Ghana. By the way, I just came from Ghana. I left January, uh, I think, 17. I spent 14 days in Ghana, and Ghana has a very clear goal. They would like to have one billion dollars in export. Yes. So I did read a lot about Ghana and I intend to go back to Ghana. Thank you for confirming that. We will meet in Ghana very soon. Yes. So a round of applause for Rosie. Uh, we have a few minutes. <laughs> Mr. Potello, um, I know that you have Mr. Mr. Chris, I want you to share and just a few minutes, like one minute. I know that you have a um, background in terms of um, cryptocurrency and you wanted to you know, share more light and you wanted to integrate it into the youth. But are you trying to, let me ask whether we have the ICT platform that you know, cryptocurrency can be more you know, resourceful for the youth to use it as a source of creating income or generating income. Thank you very much for your question. We don't have the platform as of now. We, we don't have it now, but uh, 
to me, cryptocurrency is the future, the future of digital money technology. And, and to be honest, like Africa has always been a, you know, at the back of the way. I think now is really about the time that you know, we take advantage of this new opportunity of cryptocurrency. Last year, during the spring meetings of the World Bank and, uh, and the IMF in Washington, D.C., I put together a small conference uh, about to, to, to educate the delegates from Africa because we had uh, the finance ministers from different African countries. Uh, so I wanted to have this conference to educate those ministers and delegates on blockchain and cryptocurrency technology. Because what happened a week prior to, uh, to that conference, uh, a leader from this African country was coming to Washington, D.C. at the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and, uh, and I asked the question, I'm like, uh, so Prime Minister, uh, you know, blockchain, cryptocurrency, people talk a lot about it here in the U.S., in Europe. Uh, is Africa, do we have a platform? Are we ready for it? Are we going to take advantage? And he looked at me and he, he had no idea what I was talking about. Cryptocurrency is, first of all, it was a French-speaking uh, country. So cryptocurrency, they don't understand what it is. They cannot even pronounce it because, you know, it's English and all that. So I, it was very important for me to have this conference. So I had a bunch of um, uh, experts to come in and explain to them. And it made sense. And now a lot of them want to create platform to actually have um, uh, the, the new to develop, uh, you know, to take advantage of this whole opportunity. And uh, now I would say that Ghana is, uh, is very involved into creating platforms. Uh, the Ivory Coast, uh, they, they are as well. Uh, Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, and uh, yeah, yeah. But we don't have the platform right now. We work it on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Yes, a round of applause for Mr. Potello. I mean, just to um, refresh your mind, the vision for this um, event is empowering unity among Africans worldwide by creating jobs, generating wealth, and strengthening continental sovereignty. I know, I know that your work is here in New York, but we need you in Africa as well to come and take care bring the youth together and let them know alternative ways to create more sustainable I, jobs. I, I totally agree, but we, we, need, we need Africans here, in Europe, in Africa, and yes. we, all, we all need to be connected. We are marrying diaspora in the African continent. Absolutely. That's also our goal for this event. Thank you very much. Now, um, Sandra, um, you are a researcher, finally, then we, we ended. You are a researcher. I also do a lot of research in, way back in Ghana. What, how will you integrate your research findings? Then you will, you know, advocate it to governments for them to adopt it in their policy framework. How can that be done? Are you uh, facing challenges, or is that how you you, you see it to be? Right. Thank you for the question. Uh, so just give more context. The research that I'm involved is a uh, memory loss in African Americans specifically and uh, so why we are doing this is because um, African Americans have a higher prevalence of dementia and many people does not know that and that's why we are doing because at this point we have no effective treatment and no cure and our hope is to be able to, to find um, the risk factors for it and it's specifically when it comes to ethnicity it's really important to, to do by ethnicity and and see what exactly is um, affecting African Americans. So in, in, in regards to research and how we can, how I can use my experience here uh, doing research and, and give it back to my community and my in, in Africa as well, is that, uh, for example, all these researches and the studies that are going on here is really important because it can bring solutions for the problems that's affecting us. And also if we are able to bring resources to the, to, the, to, to the continent as well and be able to do research there in our community and our population and, and also it would be great to, to find those solutions for problems that are affecting us. And um, I, I just want to give a brief comment on this that uh, uh, for all the, the jobs
jobs opportunities that we, we talk about the youth and, and we didn't mention all of the, the social and economic problems that when we don't have uh, a job security and especially affecting youth. And there's a really uh, problem in Africa that when it comes to substance abuse, uh, increase of criminal rates, and also it contributes to poverty, which is a huge problem, and it's the first goal of uh, the goals, the sustainable goals for the Agenda 2030. So um, if you want to face that and if you want to go against and and uh, improve the poverty in the country, uh, it will come to, as well with economic uh, empowerment, our, our youth, the job opportunities, and uh, increase the security for, for people be able to bring more resources to the households and increase all of the conditions, social conditions for the housing, food that was mentioned before, and also for more education and be able to have a job that they, they know that they will have it and it's, uh, it's for a, a lasting time. Also, I want to mention this that uh, we can start looking for new areas when we, we talk about natural resources. We have a lot of uh, a lot of room for growth in renewable energy, and um, and I know for sure in my country, but other countries, there's a lot of opportunities for investment that we can start empowering our youth to start investing in in areas in areas such as renewable energy. It's it's a big thing. It, in Africa, we should take advantage of that. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you so much. Let me also pause this to around the process. Yes. I mean, it's a month of, of women. Um, it's a milestone this year, 2020, because the Beijing Declaration um, we celebrated the 25 years of gender equality and empowerment of women. So thumbs up to that. Uh, we are going back to Ghana. Uh, we are doing the advocacy, pushing for parliament to pass the Affirmative Action Bill. Affirmative action bill into law, you will get 40% of women leading in major positions in Ghana. So we are pushing for that, for the, for the bill to be passed into law. We believe that women are the best managers of our resources. So thank you so much. Yes, and we will give it to the audience. If there's any question, short then we can meet our time. Questions, please? Mom? know in the audience or the panel, um, what is it that you see happening with that bill? I mean, because we can put it in place. I mean, we got bills now on the docket that says that women are supposed to do X, Y, and Z, but things are moving at a snail's pace. So what do you see happening with that? And the reason why I'm asking is because we have to now get on the ground right now, right before this pass, and get ready. Because as soon as they pass it, now we got to implement it. So we have to know what is it that you see happening with that, and how do you see us helping you push that forward and accelerating? You can ask one question. But I mean, as I said, uh, the key thing is to see 40% of women in leadership roles. Yes, because of we think that they are the best managers of our natural resources, and they can do more. And I believe that Rosie, you can also share share more that in your as well. Yeah. Well, I think Rwanda has started uh, wow, Rwanda. elevating That's elevating true. women in management, in especially in his cabinet. He has fifty more than fifty percent of yeah of women that are in. Management positions, that means in leadership positions that can make decisions that will affect the family and the rest of the population. And it's very important for us to understand, women have been the backbone of family from day one. We were simply removed from the leadership. Now we need to retake that leadership. And the way to do it is to not only manage inside the home, but also outside, so that we can combine the two and then have a force that we can empower and then invest in our social economic development. Last question for this panel and last comment that we're having. I just have a, it's a quick 30 seconds. Just wanted to mention that it was just best a bill in my company, Cape Verde, that it's obligated to all leadership positions, even colleague 
in the political position and all the leadership and management um, in my country. It has to have 40% uh, 60 either by men and women, but we know uh, for sure that at this point it's always more uh, men. And we are pushing to have at least 40% 40, 40 but the bill is already passed. So we are already in place in my country. Okay, so I got a question, um, really two quick questions. One is about the cryptocurrency. Now, I do believe that cryptocurrency can be the future, but we have a, a lot of issues when it comes to uh, people wanting to stop because of the regulation and how the banks are going to be able to regulate that. So I wanted to know, how can we get the cryptocurrency to become that future currency and minimize the bank's involvement in the regulatory uh, aspects of that so that way we as people can be able to invest as much as possible to become those millionaires that we seek to be as a community? Well, um, I, I think it's going to be kind of impossible to like get rid of the banks. We're going to have to work with them. I think that's why uh, you, know, you see a lot of um, uh, issues you know, in terms of regulation and everything. So the strategy should be to work with the bank on cryptocurrency. Because if we try to like get rid of the banks, it's just not gonna happen. Yeah. So we have to work on working with them. Minimize their involvement, not get rid of them. Yeah, yeah. 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 In actuality, cryptocurrency is a decentralized system, which means that the bank is a centralized system. So the bank controls the money flow. Now, cryptocurrency will force the bank out of the money flow, whereas we can develop money into peer-to-peer -peer and out the bank, because this is what has caused poverty for the past 200 years. A few people has, have controlled the money flow and have I could use the money flow to control nations, to control people. Now, the new generation that's coming out has decided we are not going to be controlled by a few people, by a banking system that is already corrupted, that has a lot of, uh, uh, that corrupts power, pretty much. Now the new generation wants the cryptocurrency and it's a peer-to-peer. -peer. So in other words, we don't really need banking system to use the cryptocurrency or to even develop crypto cryptocurrency, but what we really need is energy. And that's what Africa is missing. Once we have managed to develop the energy, then we can develop the cryptocurrency because then we can uh, do mining. Thank you very much.